Welcome to The Partial Historians. We explore all the details of ancient Rome. Everything from political scandals to love affairs, the battles waged and when citizens turn against each other. I'm Dr. Rad. And I'm Dr. G. We consider Rome as the Romans saw it by reading different ancient authors and comparing their accounts. Join us as we trace the journey of Rome from the founding of the city. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Partial Historians. I am Dr. G. And I am Dr. Rad. And we are super thrilled to be joined by Dr. Brett Devereaux. Hello. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to be talking today all about Roman military things, which I think is a super interesting topic and one that Dr. Rad and myself confess that we know not so much about. So we wanted to bring in somebody who was a specialist. So Dr. Brett Devereaux is a historian who specializes in the ancient world and military history. He holds a PhD in ancient history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has an MA in classical civilization from Florida State University. And he currently teaches at North Carolina State University. His research interests include the Roman economy and the Roman military. Key to this study is considering how the lives of people were shaped by structures of power, how violence and wealth are factors that influence and shape military capacity. He currently has a monograph under contract with Oxford University Press, which will be entitled Why the Romans Always Won, Mobilising Military Power in the Ancient Mediterranean. And he is also very famous online for running the popular blog, a collection of unmitigated pedantry, a look at history and popular culture. So this is super exciting. Thank you so I'm much. I'm excited. Th- thanks for having me on. I feel like our first point of controversy is going to be setting up the periods, which might be under discussion. So I have said that we're going to be talking about things possibly from the early Republic, likely from the Middle Republic, and we might touch on some things from the Late Republic. And I feel like if you're listening to this show, you might be like, okay, that's cool. The Republic has different phases. And you'll be unsurprised to learn that historians don't necessarily agree about these, and only some of the dates are unfuzzy. So the Early Republic, I'm going to say, starts in 509 BCE, when they chuck out the kings. And takes us all the way down to around about 264 BCE, which is the start of the First Punic War. But I will defer to you, Brett. What what would you say about that? I mean, I think that's a defensible end date. Um, It's the mark of when Roman military activity begins to push outside of Italy. And the First Punic War is the first moment where we get because our sources are improving over time, we get to see the Roman military machine very clearly because we have Polybius all of a sudden. And so I, I think that's a defensible date. Um, I would be tempted to to push the transition to the Middle Republic um, earlier, probably into the late 4th century, something like 338, 340, because I think the military system is functioning more or less the same way that far back, but the evidence is is weaker. But but somewhere in, in that space, yeah. And then the Middle Republic runs question mark question mark 133 107 101 somewhere in there before we begin the late somewhere Republic. with the Gracchi and Marius and yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. it gets a little bit dicey as soon as Tiberius Gracchus is elected tribune of the plebs yeah, yeah. <laughs> so around about 133 anywhere down to about 101 is the mark of the end of the middle republic and the start of the late republic and then you get into the controversy of when does the late Republic end? And it depends on how you feel about Augustus. 
So oh, you know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know you have some feelings about Augustus. So do I. Uh, strong feelings about Augustus. I'm going to say that I think the late Republic is fully over in 27 when he yeah. gets the title Augustus. It's at that point where it's like he basically owns the whole of the Senate and anybody who's willing to say anything. And at that point, I think we can say that functionally the Republic is no longer doing its thing. It's doing something else now. Are you? But Augustus told me he restored the Republic. Are you telling me he lied to me? <laughs> Would Augustus uh, do that? Would Augustus lie? I mean, I wouldn't want to say yes to that. So but, yeah. often. Brett, I, I hate to break it to you on this podcast, but uh, never believe anything a man says. <laughs> That's... That's going to make my role in this podcast very difficult. <laughs> this, is, this is going to get tough as it goes along, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with that sort of uh, chaos of periodization somewhat resolved, uh, let's jump into the first uh, sort of topic. And we're going to start broad and hopefully narrow in as we go through. Brett, what does it mean to talk about military force when it comes to ancient Rome? So this is an excitingly open-ended question. Um, obviously, <laughs> we are, for the most part, talking about armies. But already, I think when I use that word, especially when we're talking about the early republic and especially when we're talking about the first century of the early republic, as moderns, we are incorporating ideas when we use that word army that we should maybe be skeptical about. Like when we say army, we are imagining a formal military institution with things like regular issue weapons and uniforms and standardized trainings. And oh boy, are the Romans not doing that this early. Some of these, you know, military forces that we're going to talk about in the late regnal period in the early Republic are not state run armies. They are clan militias. You know, the whole extended family can go to war with your neighbors. Um, we're talking about states that are, are that dispersed in power. We also are going to get centralized armies, as we're going to see one of the major debates about the warfare in the early Republic is really when can we understand that Rome actually has a centralized army under central leadership? I think at no point in this podcast will the Romans get a uniform. Um, oh, no, man, this is what? very disappointing. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, Roman soldiers are expected to acquire and supply their own equipment through the Middle Republic. And then there is argument as to when exactly in the late Republic we start to see state issued equipment. You will sometimes see. Um, it argued that Gaius Gracchus does this, but I would say that the textual support for that is functionally non-existent. That is not what Plutarch says. And so, no, uh, he doesn't. And so we don't know. We know that by the imperial period, there is state-issued equipment, and it is being manufactured by the state, but we don't know when that starts. Um, so for most of this period, people are bringing their own kit. There are eventually regulations as to what kit they should bring. We'll get into the arguments about when those regulations are made. Um, not as early as Libby thinks. So you might like, okay, you have to have a shield and has to be kind of like this, but like the shield you bring is like whatever you want. You've decorated it how you want. Maybe you want it a little heavier, a little lighter, a little bigger, a little smaller. That's fine. Um, these aren't uniform like that. And then there's a whole sort of secondary question of, okay, what does that mean for how these guys fight? How tactically uniform are they? Certainly by the time we can see this army clearly, which, uh, you know, I mean, I would say Polybius, I think you could push this back to the Pyrrhic Wars. The Romans have a tactical system and it's fairly sophisticated. How far back you can push that, tricky, as we'll get into, but also the kind of military activity they're engaged with. Our sources are, for the most part, writing in the first century when we're talking about the early Republic, because we have cut the early Republic off 10 seconds before Polybius shows up, which is fair. <laughs> and those first century sources have a nasty habit of reading the army of their own day into the evidence they have. And the army of their day is a sophisticated, well-funded, well-equipped, semi-professional, centrally controlled force. It is, by ancient standards, a highly sophisticated and centralized army. And so, you know, Livy will read about battles happening in the 400s, and he conceives of these as like, oh, we're besieging this town for five years. And he is thinking of a high-intensity siege of the centralized army, and like, that could be cattle rustling. That could be raiding. 
this could be little more than brigandage. The army may not be this centralized. Um, and it's clear in some cases that it wasn't. We'll get this is going to be a repeated touchstone uh, to, to the Battle of the Crimea in, in 477, which is sort of a major episode that I'm going to come back to over and over again. But like what the Fabii were clearly doing here was like raids. They're not, he's like, you know, they're like laying waste and sieging the place. And like, there's 300 of them. They're not doing anything of the sort. They're like stealing cattle uh, and like pillaging barns, you know. And so it becomes really tricky to identify moments of increasing sophistication because Livy or, you know, Dionysius or Diodorus or Cassius Dio, other universal history writers that are even later, like they read like the army went here. And they think the army of their day, and it, no, um, so it, you know, it's it's there's a a huge range, and it's this is a ch continually changing institution that we get snapshots of, and then those snapshots are distorted um, with lots of blanks. Yeah, it's very reassuring to hear an expert say that because I must admit we've been quite shocked to see <laughs> how how much our sources are reading backwards. <laughs> When they're talking about the army and the fabulous Fabii, <laughs> right? Well, and notice how notice how unwilling Livy generally is to give army numbers in his early books. When Livy's going to pop back up, right? When we Livy surges back to us in two eighteen, and we get that wonderful stretch from two eighteen to one sixty seven, where we have a continuous narrative from Livy, and his sources don't suck. He loves army numbers, and they are precise. Um, he's like, there were this many men and every year the legions were filled up and everything. And he's very and he is nothing like that early on. And that's a clear signal. He doesn't have that information. He has mm. no, no idea how big these armies are. I, I mean, ironically, the Fabi is an exception. He thinks there are 300 of them, yeah. <laughs> um, though. That's a number which should immediately make us skeptical because, of course, there are lots of famous bands of 300 warriors. I was going to say, that, that feels um, like a, a, a selective <laughs> choice. Yeah, right. That's a number that we should not believe, um, but has clearly been communicated to Livy. And so, yeah, the, the sources here are are rough. I, Livy, to his credit, is is doing his best. Aw. Wholly <laughs> credulous. Um, he is occasionally skeptical. He occasionally indicates things he doesn't know. He complains about invented triumphs and consulships. There are points where he is just clearly confused in ways that perhaps a savvier writer would have concealed. But on the other hand, you know, he, he's mostly what we have. And, you know, we we're talking about the 400s and the 300s. The Romans only start writing their history themselves at the end of the third century. Ennius and Fabius picked her a long way away. And so Livy doesn't have a lot to work with. And that makes it really hard to know what's going on. Yeah, it's kind of like history is mad libs. <laughs> yeah. And then and then the sources Livy does have, he doesn't always understand. Mm -hmm. Or he has sources that don't understand their sources. Um, and the, the classic example for this is this battle. This is um, in book four of Livy, uh, this, the, the capture and then recapture of um, Fidenai in, in Latium. Ah, and, yes. <laughs> and Livy notes, it's, it's 434, that he's like, and some analysts say that there was a fight cum classi between fleets. And he's like, but that's ridiculous. There's no water here. What we know from some of our other sources, what has confused Livy and his sources, is that a classis in Livy's day means a fleet. But in early Latin, it means an army. In particular, it means the whole citizen body is an army. What his sources are trying to tell him is that, for once, like the central army, the army that is controlled by the consuls or the king, like the big army, showed up and had a fight with the other guy's big army, not just a cattle raid or something. We had a big fight. But Livy doesn't understand that. And so he's like, a battle with fleets? Like what, on this stream? Are you joking? And so he <laughs> discounts it. He's like, that obviously didn't happen. This is a made up battle because he's misunderstood how the word classes is being used because its meaning has changed. Um, there's a similar sort of, uh, we can get to the train wreck of Livy 8.8 8, um, and his description of the Roman army, but a similar problem with like, what is 
you know, what does it mean for someone to be before the spear anti Pulani? What are the ordinates? What are these units? What the hell are Akensi and what do they do? These words have changed their meanings in some cases between Livy and his sources, and he is just terribly confused. <laughs> um, and you feel bad for the fellow. He's doing his best. You know what? I, I feel a lot of uh, empathy with Livy because I feel like that a lot of the time. With <laughs> <laughs> right. We're doing our best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so look, obviously, as as we've just hinted at in that conversation there, you know that we're following the ancient written sources for the early Republic because that's where we're at in our episodes right now. So we're mostly focusing on Livy and Dionysius and Diodorus and that sort of thing. And we can see that they they did at least understand that Rome's rise to world domination was gradual and that they obviously have to do stuff, you know, to stop and explain some of these military things, as you were saying, without necessarily understanding them fully or really appreciating how they worked in this early period. One of the things we keep coming up against is this idea of the levy, because this is often used as a weapon in the conflict of the orders, where we have tribunes of the plebs who are like, there's not going to be a military levy. I don't care how severe the military situation is. And consuls who are like, ugh. You don't understand. There's a crisis going on. We have to deal with it now. We don't have time for this crap. So how do we understand the levy of the soldiers in this very early period in the 6th and the 5th centuries BCE? Right. So, and here's one of those where I'm going to be like, our sources say, and then I'm going to tell you that they're full of it. So our sources, and this is Dionysius and Livy, present the creation of a formal and centrally commanded system for the raising of a Roman levy as originating with the semi-legendary king Servius Tullius. This is the Servian constitution. I know you've discussed it. That would put it in the mid-6th century. We know the Servian constitution, as described to us, cannot date from the mid-6th century. The, the most obvious issue is, are the wealth classes based on currency amounts? Now, the good news, this is one of these rare moments of good news, Dionysius, Livy, and Polybius all provide uh, a wealth figure for the cutoff for the first class of the infantry in the Roman army. And even better yet, though they all give it in different currency units, they have given us the same figure. I think Dionysius is in Meni, Polybius is in Drachmae, and Livy is in Assays. And you're like, wow, a fixed piece of data reported by multiple sources. This must be good. Bad news. The currency conversion only works if Livy is giving it with the sextantal ass, which is the, the, the ass, the bronze Roman currency, goes through a long series of permutations. The first bit of bad news is that it straight up doesn't exist in the fifth, in the fifth or sixth century. The Romans developed currency late. But the really bad news is that the currency standard Livy is clearly using is the sextantal ass. And what must be happening, of course, because the Romans did not lay out their wealth classifications in Greek currency figures, the real number must be in assays that Polybius and Dionysius have converted. But the sextantal ass is introduced in 212. Oh, no, that's nowhere near the 6th century It's BCE. not even remotely close. <laughs> so this is... Livy, what are you doing to us? What are you doing? And so all three sources, their system, at least their numbers, must date to the Second Punic War. And I think for reasons we don't need to get into here that Polybius is describing the army of the Second Punic War, which is the army of about 40 to 50 years before he's writing. And Polybius is savvy enough to know that and tell us that because he's occasionally like, they used to do this and now they do this. But obviously, like, then that raises all sorts of questions for the entire system. Does it even make sense, for instance, for Servius Tullius to lay down a wealth system based on monetary units at all? No, there's no coinage in Italy at this point. Um, the Greeks have barely adopted coinage. It hasn't made it this far. Ironically, glance over at Athens in the same century, and you will see Solon crafting wealth classes and not defining them by coinage, but by bushels of wheat that your farm produces, which might make a lot more sense. But of course, that's not what our sources tell us. So the Servian constitution is like, is this later and retrojected? It's clearly something that the earliest Roman historians believe existed way back then. Are they anachronizing the wealth requirements? Is this later? If it's later, how much later? And so there's sort of all of these 
all of these problems. And here I'm going to break and I'm going to make this distinction repeatedly. There is a sort of traditional interpretation. And then uh, I'm going to note a specific scholar who has recently taken issue with this, which is Jeremy Armstrong, um, who has efforted to push all of the dates. I'm going to be kind of budget Jeremy Armstrong for you all for most of today. The traditional reading is to look at the Servian constitution and say, okay, the wealth classes are kind of nonsense, but the equipment described could actually be right for the sixth century, especially the implication that the wealthy who aren't super rich and on horses don Greek style equipment and that everybody else has local style equipment. Yeah, that's what we see in artwork. That's what we see in uh, elite grave depositions. That makes a lot of sense. And so the traditional view is to say that what Livy and Dionysius have done is they have taken, and probably not them, but their predecessors, have taken a military system that did exist and embellished it into something more organized, but that there is some kind of central levy that the king is in charge of. Arguing against this, right, Jeremy Armstrong pushes back at this and says, no, what you want to understand here is no centralized army. What there is is a collection of elite gentes, of these clans, and that if there is a centralized Roman army under the kings, what's happening here is that the king has gotten the heads of all of the gentes together, and those gentilic armies, which is like these elite patrician families and all of their clients, those are the compositional units of the army. It is certainly the case that we have evidence in our sources that Roman armies sometimes work like that. I will note that Livy certainly doesn't think the royal army works like that. He, for instance, thinks that the Brutus that founds the Republic is a tribune of the Celerates. He thinks that there is an office of cavalry commander, that it is an office that is like a military tribune and has that title. Interesting, because military tribunes aren't going to pop up in Livy's narrative until much later and under weird circumstances. And what's also striking is that this unit is called the Celeres, a term that I think it's Dionysius also uses, and which is not the name of a later Roman unit. So Livy is probably not inventing this. There probably really were Celeres, the swift ones, and that was the name for the cavalry before they were the equites. And so my own view, and, and here I fall somewhere between the traditional view and the kind of Jeremy Armstrong revision view, because he's convinced me on some points, is to imagine a kind of hybrid military under the kings, that there is sometimes this kind of centralized military and the king could appoint officers to it, though evidently he always appoints them out of these elite patrician gantes, who, of course, the leaders of which are the guys in the Senate and the Senate advises the king. So you can see how these institutions lock together. But we definitely have what we might describe as gentilic warfare, clan-based warfare that is happening in the background that might not involve the king. And we should also keep in mind that the king's authority here is not maybe as absolute as we think when we hear the word king. Um, it's worth noting that the, the semi-legendary and legendary Roman kings we have don't tend to come from the same family. This office isn't hereditary. They seem to be picked by the aristocracy. They do seem to have the job for life, but that makes the transition from king to elected magistrate a lot less stark. We have gone from the aristocracy picks a war leader for life to the aristocracy picks a war leader for a one-year limited term. In either case, he's drawn from the aristocracy and he has this set of powers. And in fact, he has this legal power called imperium, which is the same power. Unlike the Greeks who, when they kick out their kings, abolish royal power and split up those jobs. The Romans are like, you can't do that. Imperium is indivisible. So theoretically, I think the levy is sort of kind of working this early, at least occasionally. There is the secondary question, how far down does the levy reach? And I think here the answer cannot be very far. The Romans aren't paying their soldiers. And we certainly don't get the sense early on in Livy that the resource in manpower steamroller of the middle republic is in any way in operation so when we're imagining this army under the kings or the early republic the centralized army the non-gentilic army we're probably still imagining a pretty aristocratic institution where the elites roll up with their fancy imported style greek arms and armor 
Their clients have shown up with local italic stuff, and that's probably it. Um, it is really striking, for instance, Livy imagines that the Roman census has been conducted continuously from the dawn of the Republic. But then he sheepishly admits, this is Livy 4.8, that the censorship is created in 443. And he's like, oh, but the consuls were doing it before then. <laughs> but Livy doesn't give a census figure before 465. And we know, at least in the Middle Republic, when our evidence gets better, the census was the vital tool for general conscription. Um, that the census provided the documents by which the Romans decided who was in the army this year. So if the census isn't happening for the first 40 or 50 years of the Republic, this army must be quite narrow indeed, because there's no way to draw the full body of the citizenry into it. It sounds almost feudal in nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, it it does resonate with the sorts of things that we've been drawing from what Livy and Dionysius and Diodorus have been suggesting, because it does seem like we've got a situation where it's like it's family based, that this sort of the conflict of the orders that keeps coming up and dominates the narrative of this early Republic is a bit of a mishmash of various things that we know are going to be happening later on. And this levy sort of allows them to introduce a conflict within the citizen body about the direction of Rome. So it kind of allows for a character development, if you like, like what are Romans and how do Romans come to be Romans? And I think reading it through that kind of lens is really quite helpful. Now, you said that the, they don't get paid. And then we get this really interesting moment. Um, both Diodorus of Siculus and Livy mention that they get paid for the first time. In 406 BCE. This is a spoiler for any listeners of our podcast. I was going to say, we're just about to cover it. Don't tell them. Yeah, because we have literally not <laughs> recorded that episode yet. So I'm not going to not going to say all of my thoughts on 406 BCE yet, but it might be influenced by what you tell us, Brett. Um, this idea that the soldiers get paid all of a sudden appears. And when I came across it in the source material, I was like, oh, my God, somebody paid them. <laughs> and I was like, what are the chances? <laughs> But this is a massive year for the Romans as far as our analytic sources are concerned. They're facing trouble on multiple fronts. This is an issue that Rome seems to be facing a lot during this period, where they've got conflict coming up from the south, from the Volscians and the Aquii to the, more to the east. They've also got this pressure coming down from the Etruscans, and that seems to be hotting up again for them. And now all of a sudden, there's this sense in which they need a large, a reasonably large force in order to be able to be on all of those fronts at the same time. But we also don't... just a couple of decades out from having serious Gallic problems. <laughs> yeah. Shh. That's the spoiler, other spoiler alert. Yeah. Spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> You're just ruining oh, everything. Yeah, no, people aren't ready for that. They haven't watched the whole series. Um... Well, the Romans aren't ready for it either, so no. we're all on the same boat here. <laughs> Definitely not. So... I think it is reasonable to assume that 406 is maybe a bit of a furphy of a date, but I am interested about when and how we know that payment of soldiers develops for Rome. I mean, so we are for this substantially reliant on the reports of our sources, but we have this from Livy and Diodorus and Plutarch. And I mean, like Plutarch is like a quarter of a source when it comes to these kinds of things. And they all put it on the same date. And so there might be something to it. I think sort of the traditional scholarship, because I'm going to get to Jeremy Armstrong in a second, because uh, I do think that contrast is useful for listeners to hear, and it'll give them a sense of like the range of what we think. The traditional scholarship sees 406. Um, sometimes scholars will get spooked and they'll just say circa 400-ish. But our sources are really clear that it's 406. That see this as a key moment of development in a process that has probably begun way back in the 470s and is going to culminate, uh, again, massive spoilers, after the Gallic sack of Rome, probably <gasps> in the 380s. <laughs> and, and so if we sort of wind back, right, we want to ask, okay, where did the Gentilic armies go? Because obviously you don't need to pay your soldiers if they're all your family members and clients, right? There's a, a relationships are governing this. The traditional answer to this is 
to point at the Battle of the Crimera in 477, which I know you've discussed, um, Livy 2.49 and following, where we get like the one point where Livy is like, here is some gentilic warfare that is happening. Um, the Fabii go out, start their own war, and then lose it catastrophically. And then just to you know add on, like the Roman state then intervenes and also does poorly for a number of years. Um, so things are not going well. The traditional view has been to see this sort of catastrophic defeat and the fact that our sources never mention against doing warfare like this ever again is to say, this is the moment Gentilic warfare stops. And to see this in the context where, look, states and communities in Italy are getting more sophisticated over time. Italy is a rough neighborhood. The warfare here is, is getting increasingly no holds barred. You can start to see that with the rough way that the nascent Roman Republic treats its Latin neighbors to the south and like we're going to inflict a pretty unequal treaty on you. Obviously, they're going to resettle that treaty in the 340s and 330s, which we'll get to because that's going to change the military system. And so to see is like the Fabii go out thinking that it's still like the 560s and a single Gens can do this kind of warfare and are rudely informed by Vei that no, you can't. Um, states have become too centralized and they get steamrolled by a major state army of Etruscans. And the Romans are like, let's not do that ever again. Now, what Jeremy Armstrong will point out is that that neat divide is too neat. The Fabii start their war in 479 when it is worth noting that the head of their gens, Caeso Fabius, is the consul or praetor, maybe? Um, mm -hmm. We can get to that later. So this may have, in fact, been a Roman war. This Fabian clan army may have been a consular army. People can't see, but I'm making sneer quotes to begin <laughs> with. And so this is sort of this is sort of tricky. And Armstrong uses this and some other evidence to argue that gentilic warfare may actually be continuing later than this. And Livy may just not know it. That said, as noted shortly thereafter, we start to get um, census figures from Livy, notably compared to our other sources that give us earlier census figures. Livy's census figures do not round off to night's neat numbers. His figure for 465 is 104,714. The other convenient thing, if you, if you look at the demographic math, you think about the size of the Roman state, that number is possible. That could be a real number. Uh, some level of undercounting, surely, presumably the very poor not being counted. It's definitely only counting men. All those issues, but... Kiwium capita tote, right, which is the formula Livy always gives his census figures with, that could be the real number. So Livy may not be kidding that the census has started up at this point. That would suggest a greater desire to expand the army. And we're, of course, seeing that Rome is under a lot of military pressure in this period. And as that pressure intensifies, the Romans reach for manpower. You need to get more guys. And as you note, 406 is a gnarly year. The security situation in Italy is getting rough, and it's only about to get rougher. And so the Romans may have felt like we need to make this move. And so, again, the traditional scholarship sees this as the break point where the army is now beginning to incorporate the plebeians generally, which is, of course, going to matter for the struggle of the orders, but even poor plebeians. And that certainly fits with when we see the army of the Middle Republic. One of the things that is very striking about it is that Roman recruitment clearly reaches very far down the socioeconomic ladder. While you still have to have some property to qualify for the Roman army, it's not a lot in the Middle Republic. You know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 85, 90 percent of the citizen male body are wealthy enough to be eligible for the army, right? The Capiti Kensi, those who are too poor to serve, seems to be a very small slice of the Roman citizen body. I think Nathan Rosenstein sort of tackled this question and I think proved it. And so the introduction of pay is kind of a necessary step along this road. Now, of course, immediately Livy says they introduce pay, the stipendium uh, militarum, and, and then he doesn't give us any details. We know how legionary pay works in the Second Punic War. Um, because Polybius tells us. But we're immediately questions, can we retroject that? In the Second Punic War, we know that Roman soldiers get paid a daily wage, but that the cost of their food and supplies is subtracted from it. If they are missing any equipment or lose any of it, that is also docked from their pay. And we can certainly assume the clear implication of the system as described is that most of this pay is 
is book pay. It's being kept in the Queister's logs. They're not getting handed money very often. Sometimes, clearly, when Rome sends armies, they feel the need to send coinage with them at that late date. They certainly can't be doing it in 406 because they don't have any coinage yet. So once again, how are they paying these guys? It could be just in grain. What Livy may understand is military pay may just be the state now feeds you. It could be something that simple. And therefore, the poor can come along because they don't need to bring an allowance. It may be something that simple. Conveniently for us, like the reason we can be sure that Polybius isn't blowing smoke about the Roman pay system is that the Roman pay system continues to work exactly that way into the imperial period when the Romans politely send soldiers to Egypt where their pay stubs written on papyrus can survive. Um, and so we can read them and we can be like, oh, that's how they did the accounting, which is really which is really fun. And you see the same deductions, deductions for food, deductions for clothes. This guy wore out his sandals, like minus 15 denarii there, um, that kind of thing. <laughs> but is it working that way in 406? Is it that sophisticated? God, I'd be shocked if it was. I mean, it would be startling because, again, this is not yet really a coinage society uh, this early. Jeremy Armstrong would, I think, accept most of what I just said, but he would kind of push the dating of the implications further back. And he would want to see like the incorporation of poor plebeians. He's like, eh, he, uh, let's let's date that a little later. He sees the formation of a kind of centralized Roman army as a process, as he puts it, that runs the incorporation of the plebs that runs from 450 all the way out to 390 and a little bit further. Um, whereas I think traditional scholarship is like 406, like dot, dot, done. And I'm pretty sympathetic with Jeremy's arguments here that this is perhaps a longer process, but it's still an important break point and it's setting the groundwork for what is what is to come. I would also note here, there are a bunch of other really interesting things that are happening in the late 5th and early 4th century when it comes to warfare in Italy. And here I will note an extraordinary frustration created by the Romans. Uh -oh. It is the case <laughs> that wherever the Romans expand, starting in the 300s at least, so as they begin to pull Italy under their control, wherever they go, warrior burials and elite warrior artwork stop. This is extraordinarily obnoxious. Like you get the third Samnite war. <laughs> Samnium is finally Roman territory. And like, boom, the Samnites are not burying aristocrats with their armor anymore. And so Rome is this creeping gap in our evidence. Nevertheless, from what evidence survives, we can see that the early 300s are evidently a period of pretty radical tactical and equipment change. Whereas elite equipment prior to this, the wealthiest guys are mostly using Greek style stuff, which is both the big Greek shield, the Aspis, Greek style body armor, both Greek style helmets, and then also like local interesting variations of Greek style helmets. And you get some really wacky looking like Apollo Corinthian helmets, some of which I doubt that anyone ever actually wore. I mean, some of them really do look like display pieces rather than real <laughs> armor. Always something to be worried about. Armies create parade equipment in all periods. Folks who know the Roman army somewhat later may be familiar with imperial period cavalry masks, where you get these helmets that has like a full face mask on it. No one wore that to fight. That was that was for parade. That was not a battlefield piece of equipment. That what? was that was you know you don't you don't helmet. want to you don't want to see things when you're on the battlefield. I know, right? Oh, like, yeah. I, Madness. Um, <laughs> it helped me go into battle if I couldn't see what was lying ahead. That's <laughs> true. Um, but so we have that sort of system. And what we see in the 300s is the clear influx of a lot of external, we might say, military material culture. The, the round Greek style aspis drops away. Livy explicitly says that this happens with the introduction of military pay. It is replaced by the cheap guy's shields, um, which are these larger rectangular shields. We know from artwork that rectangular central bossed shields like this existed in Italy earlier, but it's also pretty clear from the structure of the Roman shield, once we can see it clearly later, that the Romans have borrowed design elements from the Latin shield, the Gallic or Celtic shield from the north. Um, so this is a sort of a fusion of an Italian shield shape 
with design elements that are Gallic to create a kind of distinctly Italian riff on the Latin oval shield. At the same time, we get Greek sword forms. The coppice and the xiphos begin to vanish, replaced by, our evidence is really thin, but it seems like Gallic sword forms. Um, we have one really neat sword from this period that, God bless it, is inscribed. And it's Smith has said, I made this in Rome. Nice. Beautiful. You better look after that man. Um, <laughs> you can't offer striking. a better piece of evidence, really. <laughs> I know, it's beautiful. And then someone deposited it in a sanctuary so that we can have it. What's striking is its form. If the inscription wasn't on it, we would have said this is an early Latin sword, a Latin one sword. And so we're like, okay. So the Romans have picked up a Gallic style shield. They're picking up a Gallic style sword. This is not yet the Gladius, to be clear, or let me rephrase. This is not yet the Gladius Hispaniensis. It's not the famous Gladius. Gladius itself is not a native Latin word. That looks to be a Celtic word. The Romans have imported a word to describe these swords they're picking up. Latin has its own perfectly serviceable word for sword, ensis, which becomes poetic and very archaic and no one uses it. <laughs> In addition, at the same time, we see some of these fancier Greek style helmets beginning to get pushed out by the Monte Fortino helmet type, um, which is also an Italian take on a Gallic helmet. And by the first Punic War, Monte Fortinos are plastered. Of, that's just what the Romans wear. All of them everywhere. You can tell when the Romans have shown up because suddenly you have a ton of Monte Fortinos in the archaeological record and every other helmet type vanishes. Look, it sounds um, like they've learned a lot from whatever happened when they lost to the Gallic when forces. When they lost, <laughs> indeed. And so, so you have a number of things that are happening. Um, I should note also the pilum, the Roman heavy javelin seems to be adopted in this period too. And I think Jeremy Armstrong is right to say probably also from the Gauls. The Romans think it's from the Samnites, and Jeremy thinks they're wrong, and I think he's right that they're wrong. It's it's probably from the Gauls. And so you have military pay is introduced in 406. The Romans lose badly to the Gauls in 390. By 338, Livy is describing a military system that has begun to look like the one we'll see later, although, again, Livy is terribly confused, and it is predicated on a lot of Gallic kit. And it does now seem fully centralized, state-run, based on a mass conscript levy. So this seems to be the critical period where the sort of Polybian Roman army that we know and love is coming into being. Now, the great news is, hey, we finally know what's going on. The bad <laughs> news is, suddenly, we have to question any retrojection of any of these things earlier than this point. Because we're like, wait. There's clearly from like 410-ish to like 380-ish a period of significant change, not just in, in how they're paid, in who serves, in how they're organized, in how they fight, in the stuff they used to fight. So what can we know before then? And Jeremy argues that actually the Servian constitution probably dates to this period. He is a break from older scholarship in this regard. But you can see why that argument would be seductive, but it would render us even more blind to what's <laughs> happening in the earlier 400s. I was what going I'm to say, is, now, now we're missing a whole hundred years where we don't yeah. know anything. Yeah. It's no wonder what that I'm we constantly is, tie is, ourselves in knots over uh, saying anything <laughs> factual about this yeah, period. Right, no, exactly. What I'm saying is Roman history starts in 264. Yeah. And I mean, really, like, you guys are a myths podcast. Um, is, 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 is what I was wondering. That's it. We'll have to update our tagline. I Roman know, right? mythology brought to you by right. Smart right. Ladies. In the interview now. I know, I, know. I know, right? Now I'm never getting invited back. Um, no, look, look I, the next question I'm about to ask you seems like a really stupid question, given what you've just said. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously... When people are writing about these sorts of periods, they have to come up with some numbers sometimes to get an idea of, you know, the scale of the battles and all of that kind of stuff. And given everything you've just said, that seems nigh on impossible. <laughs> but can you give us any idea about the size of the army? Like, how big do you think it would have been in the early Republic? How big is it in 
you know, when we get to the more the reliable periods, like later on in the Middle Republic, and even maybe how on earth do you get to those figures <laughs> if the sources are just so terrible? Right. And so for the early Republic, like any answer has to lead with we don't know. You know, as noted, we only get census figures that I think are remotely reliable in 465. And even then, I think a lot of scholars would not trust anything before the 300 census wise. But with, the, you know, if the Romans do in 465 have a citizen body of like 100,000 adult males, well, not all of those are going to be some of those are going to be old people. Mm. So, you know, that's a pretty limited manpower pool. You're not calling all those guys out all at once. Or if you are, then you can't keep them out because they somebody needs to farm. And so, I mean, that implies a Roman army that is radically smaller. I would be shocked if the Roman army of the 400s could field more than five or 10,000 men at a time. It is really striking that when our sources start talking about the legion, it sure seems like there must have been a point where there was just one legion. And the etymology of the legion, literally the people picked out, sure sounds like there's just one of them. And then later they have multiples. And the legion standard size later is around 5,000. And the Romans stick to that standard size throughout their whole history. And so one wonders if like the early Republican army was a legion. Um, mm -hmm. Like here's like 5,000 guys. This is about what we have. Now, of course, that suggests something a lot more regular than, than we should probably imagine. But maybe that kind of scale. But the broader answer is we don't know. And so much of this military activity must have been much smaller scale cattle raiding and and. It does herbicide. sound like that. There's a lot of mention of they raided us, we raided them, they saw some cows. <laughs> right. Well, and there's a lot of there's a lot of battles where it's like there was a battle and the Romans were utterly cut to pieces. And then next year it's like nothing happened. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, well, that army <laughs> we, couldn't have been that big. Yeah, that's what we find. We we find these dramatic statements like the Volskians were wiped from the face of the earth. And then it's like, and the next year. The Volskians fielded an army against the Romans. Right. And you're wondering if what your sources are looking at is like, there was a fight between maybe a few hundred Volskians and a few hundred Romans, and the Romans utterly crushed those guys. But that this is just one episode in a larger conflict. And then Livy comes to this description, and all Livy has is some source says, we met the Volskians and we killed all of them. Yeah. And so Livy <laughs> is imagining huge army. He's imagining like Second Punic War, 80,000 man armies wiping each other out. And it, it has not occurred to him that like that cannot be the case. As we move into the, the 300s, the Roman citizen body is getting bigger, um, in part because Roman territory is expanding. And as noted, we're imagining they're reaching a lot further down into, into the sort of manpower pool. We might, by this point, be getting to something like the system we're eventually going to have, where each consul normally raises two legions. I mean, conveniently, 367 is when we're finally going to get to the point where we get two consuls every year with any regularity. <laughs> um, I mean, like, God only knows how the army, when you had military tribunes with consular powers, how that was even structured. Like, we don't know. Livy doesn't know. Um, <laughs> Chaos, I say. <laughs> I, yeah, I, who knows? <laughs> But um, but you might have something like that if each consul has two legions, that would imply maybe about 20,000 troops. Um, the Romans in the early 300s, the Roman alliance system doesn't really exist yet. So the enormous uh, resource advantages that it provides have probably not kicked in. The Romans sort of have control over Latium. But the Latins are still at this early point understood as like quasi-independent allies. They fight under their own armies and have their own leaders. That's going to change in the 340s and the 330s. The Romans are going to have another Latin war. We're not told, but the general assumption is that this is the point where the Romans shift. And Livy actually does kind of say this, um, that this is the point where the Romans choose to shift from their old system of alliances, which federal leagues and alliances like this were very common in Italy, to the Soki E system that we're going to see them conquer the world with, where all of the allies only have a bilateral treaty with Rome. They're required to supply soldiers to Rome's armies. Those soldiers serve in small units under their own officers, but those are just attached straight to the legion. And the number of allied troops is roughly equal to the number of Roman troops. And so now you're going to go, okay, so if both consuls are out, it's not 20,000 men, it's like 40,000 men. And now you're starting to get like the beefier Roman armies as we move into the 200s. 
And these are sort of armies. And then sometimes the Romans double up these armies. So maybe you put both consuls in one place. You now have a 40,000 man field army. Um, right. That's quite sizable. That's a, that's a lot. By ancient standards. Mm -hmm. That's about as large as Alexander the Great's army invading mm -hmm. Persia. Um, wow. That's sizable. <laughs> um, and that might be the kind of thing that the Romans are throwing around in, say, the second and third Samnite Wars as we get into the Pyrrhic Wars. And then, of course, when we get into the Punic Wars, we watch the Romans deploy absolutely staggering mobilizations. Estimates, I think, of the peak mobilization for the Romans in 214, I think it is, is 185,000 men under arms in a single year. Wow. Um, which is, and and what I would just stress is, you do not want to imagine that the early Republic can do something like that. It can't. <laughs> the Romans can do something like that because they've constructed a system to draw the resources of all of Italy together. For more about this, see my book project in a year or two. Because um, this is what I'm. This is what I work on. Um, you can hear me get excited. But that system is coming into being in the 300s, and we probably want to imagine it as an even longer process of state centralization, pulling the plebeians into the army, probably rich plebeians first, poor plebeians later, through the 400s into the early 300s, motivated by increasing security pressures. And we're certainly seeing in Italy increasing security pressures. The Etruscans are cooperating more. They'll eventually make one big alliance to try to contain the Romans in the Third Samnite War. The Samnites are forming tribal confederacies that seem to work together. Even the Greek states, and my God, to get Greeks to cooperate. Um, <laughs> but even the Greek states seem to be occasionally working together. And then you have the Gallic threat, which obviously post 400 is clearly intense. Occasionally, large armies of Gauls from northern Italy roll in and wreck everyone's afternoon. And that's going to remain a threat. Right, the Romans are going to subdue Cisalpine Gaul in the 220s, and then Hannibal is going to roll over the Alps in 218 and unsubdue Cisalpine Gaul, and then the Romans are going to spend the next two decades resubduing Cisalpine <laughs> Gaul before the sort of Gallic threat kind of finally recedes. Although it's going to explode back into focus at the end of the first century with the Cimbri and the Teutones, so those those tricksy Gauls are never gone. They're just they're just over the Alps. With their dastardly <laughs> oval shields and long, long swords waiting to ruin your day. Uh, just makes me long for written material from them so badly. <laughs> God, you, you have no idea how much I wish we knew more about their about their society. The, I mean, the fact that their society is only described from the outside. Our most sustained description is from Julius Caesar while he's genociding them. And you're like, yeah. well, that's... That's not great. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, similar frustrations about how little we know about what's happening in pre-Roman Spain, but that's sort of neither here nor there for this. I can yeah. come back for the Punic Wars and then we can talk about pre-Roman <laughs> Spain. I think what you've set up with thinking about like, you know, there's this kind of influx over time of Roman expansion, the way that Rome brings other peoples underneath its sort of aegis and then starts to draw upon those resources for its own ends. This is something that is increasing in pressure over time. And I think you've touched on this already, but I'm interested in some of the, the sort of details. The size and composition of the legion in the early and middle republics, if we can even talk about it in early, you're, you're saying about 5,000 is probably where it sits. And Maybe, but like wild guesstimate there. Mm -mm. Right. Right. I mean, it's based on almost nothing. <laughs> that, hey, welcome think... to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to history, yeah. <laughs> where it's like we've just got gaps and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. And But the Roman Legion becomes hugely famous uh, for many reasons, particularly because of its success, I would say. I was going to say, and it does a lot of winning. It does a lot of winning. And people really hold on to that and... I, it turns into this whole sort of modern masculinity element as well, where people see that kind of like victory element and they accrue that to themselves, which I think is really fascinating, um, but maybe a bit odd as well. Often they accrue it to themselves in ways that would be utterly alien to the Romans, which is, is very is very striking. There are there are many byways that this conversation could go down right now. And I'm going to resist <laughs> them all. Resist those. <laughs> resist those. 
But is there anything that we can say about the internal organization of a legion? And when might we be able to say that at its earliest point, do you think? Yeah. So looking back to the Serbian constitution, although remember question marks about when, that suggests a kind of army in in what we might say is like three tactical components. You have really rich guys on horses, and there aren't very many of them. You have the regular elite on foot, equipped as hoplites. Older historians assumed that they also fought like late archaic Greek hoplites. That has come under a lot of question now. The kit does not require the fighting style. So this may not be a phalanx. And and Lord knows, like arguing about what a phalanx even is this early is a tar pit. Um, <laughs> and so we can just not go there. I was going to say, let's, that let's resist that too. <laughs> which is certainly an equipment that implies that this is what we would call a shock formation. These guys expect to march into Spears Reach and stab you up close mm. and personal. By contrast, the the lighter infantry of the poor guys, they certainly seem to pick up javelins really quickly. That fits with what we see in artwork and archaeology across Italy. We see lots of, of infantry with javelins. So you'll have a shield and a sword and maybe a spear and then one or two javelins also. And so you could imagine these guys, you could put them in close combat and they have that big shield for a reason, but probably they're also peppering each other with javelins. And so that's a lighter infantry component. And if we understand the army of, say, the 400s, as I think we should, as a predominantly aristocratic element, then we should probably imagine that the guys with the Greek style stuff are the centerpiece and that the poor soldiers are a screening and supporting element. Though again, how much this is guesswork. Certainly we get no indication in Livy that cavalry is ever central to the Roman way of warfare. So the really rich guys on horses never accomplish a whole lot unless they devote themselves and die gloriously so that the infantry can win. Yeah, they get to charge uh, in, you know, unexpectedly. This <laughs> does make Lucius Tarquinius <laughs> rise to power through his leadership of the cavalry somewhat questionable now <laughs> well but of course the cavalry are the wealthiest and the most elite so, so they are the social upper crust but tactically are they the most important guys of course in the regnal period who the hell knows maybe but but by the 400s no i mean warfare in italy really does seem to be uh, an infantry first military system mm. similar to what we see in greece where also the very rich in greece ride into battle sometimes but like Nobody expects the cavalry to win battles unless you're Thessalians. <laughs> as we sort of move forward, the as I noted, the first moment where we get an organizational description of the Roman army is Livy 8.8, which he places in 338. Though he's not saying that this organization is created in that moment. He's just like, this is what the army looks like in 338. Mm. So it may have looked like that for a while. The equipment that makes that army function the way it does has been around for several decades by this point. Livy thinks the shield has been around since 406. Um, so maybe it's been this way for a while. The traditional guess is that the military reform happens in the immediate aftermath of 390. No one tells us this. So it is a guess. <laughs> Put no weight on that leg. It's plausible, though. The army that Livy describes in 338 clearly does not derive from the Serbian constitution. It is a heavy infantry-based force. There are three key lines in heavy infantry. They are Hastati, Principes, and Triarii. And we're like, ah, we know those from Polybius. The Hastati may have already lost their spears. Uh, they clearly must have had them because they're Hastati and the Hostus is a spear. The Hosta is, is a spear. So their their name means spearmen. And yet the moment they're visible to us historically, they no longer have spears, <laughs> um, which tells you they once did. And then there are other kinds of troops in this picture that confuse Livy. There are Rorarii. He doesn't know what they are, and neither do we. And then there are the Akensi. Livy imagines the Akensi as like he's trying to fit them into like the battlefield deployment of the army. That word probably means something like attendance. And we generally assess that these guys are non combat. It's your butler. You brought your butler to the, to the <laughs> battlefield. This guy carries your stuff or they're the cook or the carpenter or what have you. And we know the later Committee of Kenturiata gives the Akensi their own century, Ooh. Um, grouped with the musicians and the artisans. 
as groups that don't serve as combat soldiers in the army, but do get their own sentry. So they're not all slammed into the sentry of the very poor, suggesting that these maybe are like professional non-combat support personnel, something like this, attendants. I love this though. You're on the battlefield. You've just hit somebody with a sword. You're like, I need a drink. Somebody bring me my beverage. Alfred! Well, you're probably, so I must say, you're probably not doing that. The Akensi are probably <laughs> hanging back at the camp when you're actually fighting the battle. And in some of these battle narratives, and of course, I don't have the citation to hand for this. When the camp comes under attack, it seems like then the Akensi may fight and defend the camp. So they're not right. frontline guys, but maybe they're like logistics troops. Yeah, yeah. They know how to hold a sword. Livy's battle narratives also attest to guys that he describes as leves milites, light troops. And if you, those of you who know the later Roman army are like, why aren't you just calling these guys Walites? That's what Polybius calls them. Because the Walites don't exist until 212. When Livy actually stops to tell us that this body of troops called Walites has come into existence. The general kind of consensus of the scholarship is to imagine that the Rorari probably are the Leues Milites, the light troops, probably drawn from the lowest classes in Rome that still have enough property to fight, and that they probably have a similar role to the Walites. And then the question becomes, what exactly is the reorganization that leads to the name change? And the answer is, we don't know. Mm. Uh, irritatingly, Livy does not tell us how the Rorari are equipped. <laughs> which would answer a lot of questions, but he doesn't give it to us. But no wonder um, he's confused then. He doesn't know what they're holding, so he can't come up with a, a way of describing and it's a unit what they that, do. It's a I'm unit kind of... that didn't <laughs> exist by the time his sources did. So he's like, these guys are there. I'm kind um, of imagining people that come up and go, rawr. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, That's their whole job, yeah, yeah to be scary yeah, vocally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's been some arguments about the etymology of Rorari and maybe like what this word means and that, that maybe it's it's a word that kind of indicates like essentially like something little more than a mob, just like you've grabbed some peasants with their pitchforks and you're going at it. Um, I think I just settled that debate. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, they're guys that go right. Yeah. Um, and now I just want to note, because I realize I haven't given this caveat, but I've spent the last five minutes talking about Livy 8.8. The amount of confidence we can put on Livy 8.8 is not great. Generally speaking, so so there are layers of problems here. I've already indicated Livy doesn't understand his sources. We know he has Polybius. He clearly has some other sources. He seems like he might be trying to harmonize sources that do not harmonize. Yeah. Um, because he's got Maniples and Ordines and Polani, and he does not know how these units fit together, and it may be because they don't. The other problem with Livy 8.8 because, you know, why not, is that the text is also clearly corrupt at points. Um, this is a case where there are clear scribal errors in the text that we have, which just adds, so Livy is confused, and then we don't even really have a perfect sense of what Livy wrote. Mm. As a result, most scholars will put Livy 8.8 and say, apart from, like, really general information, even this form of the Roman army is beyond salvage, Roman military history really begins with Polybius and Polybius dates his army to 216. And obviously by then we're, we're, we're really late. I think the last person I can think of who made the sort of sportsman like effort to salvage Livy A8 is Peter Connolly tried back in the 1980s. Um, Lawrence Kepi, by contrast, looks at Livy A8 and is like, no, mm -mm, mm -mm, cannot be done. <laughs> and, and most scholars have, have, sort of discretion is the better part of valor. No, we can't know very much about, about this source. But there are a few things we can say. The three lines of Roman heavy infantry exist. That speaks to a different tactical system. If you've got your Servian constitution, then you probably have one body of heavy contact infantry and Greek style equipment in one line. That's you know probably like six, eight, 12 men deep, something like that. By contrast, by Livy 8.8, we have a Roman army in a triplex Achies, in the three Roman battle lines that we see layer, later, that presumably means that the maneuver method of changing out one battle line for the next exists, which is attested in our later sources. That probably means that the Romans are fighting in smaller units with intervals between them, because that's how they do that interchange later. So the implication is that the Romans have, by the late 300s, discovered the tactical system 
that they will then ruin everybody else's day with. And interestingly, Livy notes, the Latins opposite the Romans for the battle is about to happen, he says, fight exactly the same way with exactly the same kit. Lord knows this will be true later. The Roman allies, the Socii, fight exactly the way the Romans do. They are tactically indistinguishable. And so this process of convergence of homogenization seems to be well underway at this point. And the archaeological evidence seems to back that up, that the sort of what becomes whatever becomes the standard Roman equipment pushes out all other forms and those forms vanish. And so that that seems to be seems to be happening there. But more broadly for organization, I mean, it's hard to say. The organizational element of Livy A8 is the part that is the worst of a mess. I mean, his math doesn't work. He's like, there's this many guys and this many guys and this many guys, and that leads to this many guys total. I'm like, Livy, I added your numbers together, and they don't give me that number. Um, uh, damn it, the math doesn't work. <laughs> and the question is, has Livy made a math error, possible, mm. or has a scribe made a math error? Because we know the text is damaged. And so, you know, Lord only knows. Presumably, this army is commanded by consuls. Now, if you if you read Livy somewhat on a surface level, which I know we don't do here, you're going to be like, <laughs> oh, the moment the Republic is formed, we have two consuls in the very first year. This is great. If you read a little bit more closely, Livy admits in our other sources, note that the earliest Roman officials were not consuls, but praetors. But then Livy turns around and says the praetorship is established in 367. <laughs> it well, does so, it does create some confusion i will yeah, some confusion <laughs> and of course you've also been working through already the problem that the romans start deciding to also have years where they don't have consuls but they have a variable number of military tribunes with consular powers the nature I was gonna of that say, office yeah. <laughs> is almost wholly obscure yeah and then dictators as well you know <laughs> and dictators too yes we have dictators flying you know working around too um, so the Romans have like at least three different speeds for chief magistrate that they seem to pick <laughs> almost at random on a year to year basis. What we know about the military tribunes is that after 367, they stop getting consular powers. Interestingly, the standard number of them, the most common number seems to be six. When we get to Polybius, we are told every legion has six military tribunes assigned to it. And so that's suggestive. Like, is this the Republic has one legion in this early point, and it is either led by a consul, or if we don't have a consul, then his power devolves onto the six military tribunes he would have had otherwise. Mm. That's how it works later. Is that how it works earlier? In any case, later on, these military tribunes, they do come in sixes, though, of course, six is not a consistent number in Libby, and you have years <laughs> with four and years with three and years with nine, and like, uh, it's usually six. And this is another case where we're confused. Livy is confused. The consular Fosti is confused, right? <laughs> this is the Fosti Capitolini, which proudly lists consuls in those first years when we know they must be praetors. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, it's one of these cases where, like, we know our sources are wrong, and mm -hmm. that undermines what we can tell. And the and the military tribunes with consular power are so often represented as being selected as an option because of internal politics they're very rarely connected to the military stuff and you're like is there not some connection perhaps some to some other time <laughs> well and what you wonder is a situation are these guys just tribunes that is tribal officers yeah yeah exactly um and after 367, when Roman office, Roman office holding becomes regularized, these tribal officers pick up that military nature, and there's also a need to distinguish them from the other tribal officers, the plebeian mm. tribunes. Yeah. And so you start calling them military tribunes. Are they even called that this early, or are they just <laughs> tribal officers? Because remember, we also had a tribal officer for the Keller race in the last days of the kingdom. So you can have a lot of different kinds of tribunes. And the, and the answer here again is we don't know the, uh, the other caution I always want to throw out here because we mentioned dictators um, that I just want to say the other problem, how does living in our sources understand the dictatorship and thing to understand is 
the Romans have the dictatorship from between 501 and 202. The Romans have, I think, 85 dictatorships involving about 70 individuals, some excitement in trying to figure out when they're the same guy or when they're not. <laughs> After two, between 201 and 84, the Romans appoint zero dictators. The office ceases to exist. Sulla then reinvents the dictatorship. And it is a completely different bag. It is clear that it functions radically differently. Sulla has way more powers. He has the ability to legislate by fiat, which dictators don't seem to have earlier on. He can't be countermanded by a tribune, which dictators do seem. Even people in the first century seem to have been aware that dictators should be vetoable by a tribune. Mm. But Sulla is not. And so and and the appointment process is completely wrong, too. So Sulla recreates the dictatorship as a much more absolute, much more powerful office. And that's the dictatorship that Livy knows, because, of course, Caesar uses it again then subsequently. Mm. But it is almost unrecognizable from what we see earlier on. And so every time you see a dictator, you also have to ask, is this position anywhere near as powerful as Livy thinks it is? Because the image of the dictator he has in his head are these late Republican figures where it's a very different institution, separated by more than a century from what I term uh, the customary dictatorship. Mm -hmm. I talk about like there's a there's a most maiorum dictatorship, the customary dictatorship, and then there's the civil war dictatorship, the sort of late Republican dictatorship. And we should think about these as separate institutions, but the Romans definitely don't. And so you have to ask how much anachronism are you getting out of that too? I kind of love the early dictatorships in Livy because he'll describe, you know, all the amazing things that they managed to accomplish. And then he'll be like, and seven days after being appointed dictator, he laid down his house. You're like, that was seven days? <laughs> right. Well, remember, it's a much smaller community. I know, I know. It's just funny. And power <laughs> is much more tightly entwined, it seems, around, around the elites, around a handful of elite families. So yeah, I mean, like, when there are like 30 families that matter in this society, and you're one of them, um, and you're given the other 29 give you absolute power, and everybody can meet on a soccer pitch. Yeah, yeah you can get everything done really quickly. Yeah, you're uh, like, Bob, Bob, it's you for the next two weeks, and then you're done. <laughs> right. And the military crisis that you have to resolve is maybe that there are like 600 guys from that town over there that have been stealing cattle. And so you roll out and you beat them up. And then you're like, and and look what I've done. I, you know, right. <laughs> Livy again, Livy imagines this as major wars, but they aren't necessarily major wars. I know. I, um, like, I don't know if you'll get this reference and I apologize because I'm not sure how familiar American audiences are with Blackadder. But whenever we talk. OK, good. Excellent. Whenever we talk about some of these conflicts, I always imagine that scene in Blackadder where they have the chunk of turf in the office and they're like this is how much territory we want today what's the scale yeah. it's one to one <laughs> yes one to one <laughs> um no i mean and and i mean it has to be because rome is fighting these wars and winning them and losing them and what have you but the radical roman expansion doesn't happen until the 300s right yeah rome in 406 is not much stronger wider more controlling than rome was in 509 mm -hmm. and so like these conflicts cannot have been very decisive or there would be no one left <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the one of those things where it's like there's this must be this booty exchange going on where it's like you do some raiding you pick up the stuff that you lost last year and you're like yay we got our stuff back and then yeah. they come and raid you and they steal the stuff again you're like oh no and so this is a sort of perpetual uh, inter-neighbor warfare that is going on. So Rome is really small on the Mediterranean stage at this point. That's really clear. And there are some big players and they are not one of them. But, yeah. and I, I think this leads Fortunately nicely. Fortunately for the Romans, the big players are far away. Yes. yes and they're exactly. not interested they're, in them. They're it's big like they're too in small. their tiny area. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they, they actually want to be big in their tiny area. That's what's clear, but they're not. Like they're constantly having issues from their literal next door neighbors. It's not yeah. even the guys like one tribe over the hill away. It's the guy on the hill who's looking down Vey at them. Vei is right there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like like Vei is inside the urban boundaries of the city of Rome as it exists today. Yeah. And like, it's not cl particularly close. Yeah. Rome is the leading city of Latium, but Latium is not like 
the hub of Italy. So, you know, Rome is like, ah, you know, we're like the biggest town in like the third largest region. <laughs> okay. Wow, guys. Wow. <laughs> like, good job, right? Like, the, yeah, the real action is clearly either in the Greek states clinging to the southern coast or the Etruscans to the north. Yeah. Um, you know, at this early point. And and there actually have been, I should note, efforts to sort of understand like the early Roman army as a sort of imitation Etruscan army. This is certainly the lens I mentioned Peter Connolly. This is the lens Peter Connolly takes. Jeremy pushes back a little bit on this, which is fair, but the Etruscan influence is clearly not nothing. And it's like, well, yeah, their cities are bigger than you and they're stronger than you. Like the Etruscans at this point are telling the Greeks and the Carthaginians to piss off out of their waters. Pardon my language. Um <laughs> Which generous. is not something the Romans are doing <laughs> yeah. um, and won't be doing for a while. Yeah, and I think that the idea that somehow Rome is somehow unique, even though it's sitting directly on this sort of southern tip of Etruria and Etruscan influence, and there's clearly intercrossovers and cultural exchange going on. And if Etruscan warfare is something that is happening in a way that they're getting to win, obviously you're going to adopt that kind of style and tactics in order to combat that. Yeah, it's clear one thing that we have in, in Italy is what the fancy political scientists will call convergence under conditions of interstate anarchy, which is <laughs> when you have a whole lot of states that are all fighting in a kind of winner-take-all brawl, they're in a kind of arms race of militarism where every successful military innovation is almost immediately copied by all of your neighbors. Um, if folks want to think about a more a, a more recent period, like think early modern Europe um, for this kind of like cockpit of fighting where like if that guy now has cannon, you need cannon and mm -hmm. you needed them yesterday. And And part of what we see, and we see this borne out in Libby's narrative, and I think we may be questioning the particulars, but I suspect we can trust the theme, is that the Romans are repeatedly put under conditions of military duress and forced to alter significant social structures to maximize military potential. Yeah. I will say if there is one genius of the Roman Republic, it is that the Roman ruling class seems never to have missed an opportunity to develop military power. When their neighbors have good weapons, they adopt them. If you need to cede a little bit of power to the plebeians in order to get their guys in your army, you do that. When the Romans do begin expanding in Italy, what's really striking is most empires conquer their neighbors and are like, I'm going to get rich by imposing tribute on you. I'm going to put taxes on you, and then I'm going to spend lavishly. And the Romans are like, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep our very minimal state budget. We're going to continue funding our own army through our own land tax. It's like not a thing empires do. Instead, what we want from you is troops, and we want them to arrive equipped, and we would like you to pay them um, so that you handle all of that. So what we're asking for is like a unit of military power mm. pre-processed for us so that we can use it immediately. And as the Romans expand in Italy, they repeatedly make this decision to structure their arrangements internally and externally in ways that maximize military potential. And in the end, of course, produce the preposterous Roman war machine of the Middle Republic that becomes absolutely unstoppable, and the Romans bowl over the other great powers. With the exception of Carthage, it ends up looking almost effortless. Mm. Like only the Carthaginians put up a halfway decent fight, you know, when it comes down to it. Outside of Italy, obviously, like Pyrrhus can get some credit here too. Um, <laughs> but um, all of the Romans just like they just drown Pyrrhus in men and equipment. They're just like, we will keep losing armies until you lose interest. And we will, we will definitely, you will definitely run out of interest before we run out of armies. And I do want to stress, because I am an arms and armors guy, do not think about those kinds of decisions purely in terms of manpower and men. It's not just people they're throwing at this. It is money. It is equipment. It is animals, horses and pack mules. It is supplies for these camps. They are mobilizing economic resources on a preposterously staggering scale. But that is all the product of a hundred, hundred decisions, most of which are invisible to us, mm. often presented to us in like these Livian just so stories about Roman virtues that we probably shouldn't trust. But I think the underlying process is clearly happening. And it's a strikingly different decision making process than many other states made. 
I mean, my mind always jumps to when the Athenians found themselves in possession of an empire, they taxed it and built really big temples in Athens and and created social welfare programs like jury pay. Mm. When the Romans find themselves in possession of an empire, their first question is, how can I turn this into more armies to get more empire? <laughs> um, which comes down, of course, I think, to the political motivations. If you're the consul, you don't get a triumph for bringing in tax revenue. You get a triumph for winning battles. Mm. So your question, whatever resources you have, is like, how can I turn these into winning battles? Because that is what my political system rewards. And yeah. even it has to be even certain types of battles, right? right. Like ones that are going to be in glory. Like if like if you're yeah. like Crassus and fighting a bunch of slaves, they're like, well, right, that's yeah. no good. Thanks for taking care of that, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. There's no yeah, triumph no. for that one. No. Um, and the other thing I would note is that by all indications. Roman Italy is not unique in this militarism race. Everybody else is doing this too. And Rome's last big shattering wars before it completes its conquest of the peninsula are against giant federal entities like it. The Etruscans all band together to try and stop the Romans. They get a whole bunch of Gauls and Samnites in their coalition to try and contain the Romans. And the moment the Romans are done with that, all of the Greek cities pool together, invite Pyrrhus of Epirus over, and also make a kind of combined effort because the same pressures that are working on Rome are working on everybody else. Mm -hmm. Rome just happened to be the state that mastered the system. But I'm not sure if it had been an Etruscan state, if it had been another Latin state, if it had been a Samnite state. I'm not actually sure the system would have looked very different. The, the one thing I will say is probably unique about the Romans is precisely because they sit on this meeting point of cultures with Latins and Sabines and Etruscans, they do seem to be better at handling multicultural alliance systems <laughs> yeah. than just about anybody else. And I suspect that cultural competence comes from their geographic position. Mm -mm. Interesting, interesting. So I think this taps in nicely to the idea that you've touched on, which is the logistics side of things. So one of the things that happens in this early Republican period that we're navigating is that they talk about the way that drawing people out into the army is maybe a recipe for leaving the fields, which need to be tended by somebody, open to becoming fallow, to not being harvested properly. And the consequence down the line in the first year is that you don't get a great crop, but the consequence in the second year is that you haven't grown anything at all. And feeding an army is obviously a massive undertaking as Rome gets bigger and bigger. But these early periods suggest that maybe this is a lesson that they're learning gradually as they go along. Yeah. Although, of course, we also want to be on guard against our sources. This idea of manpower shortage and of leaving the fields untended or at least untended by free labor Mm. is a major theme in our late authors. And so one wonders, is Livy reading the civil wars into his sources and like, well, they're going to war all the time. So clearly the fields must be empty. This must be the problem. On the <laughs> other hand, if you are going to war all the time, yeah, you may be straining your labor reserve. And now an army on the march is not supplied from home, usually in this period. The problem is what I refer to as the tyranny of the wagon equation, although the Romans aren't using wagons for this, they're using mules. Anything in the ancient or indeed anything in the pre-1800s AD world that moves food, eats food, except for sailboats. And so at some point of distance, your army, you can't ship food from base to supply them, at least not without tremendous expense. You have to set up magazines and relays and it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the Romans certainly aren't doing that yet. They will later. Um, the Romans, you know, again... By the Middle Republic, the Romans are shipping grain across the Mediterranean to support military operations. Their logistics become staggeringly sophisticated. Not this early, though. So instead, your armies, you can carry a bit of food with you, but not a lot. Food is heavy. So what you do is you pillage the farmland you're moving over. You take their food. We know that by the Middle Republic, again, the Roman legion is incredibly sophisticated in this regard, that the Roman legion can do the entire wheat processing cycle within it. Um, the Roman soldiers, they carry threshing tools and sickles and portable mills. These are hand mills. They're, um, they are hand mills in that <laughs> you turn them by hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a bit like having your coffee grinder 50, with you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's about a 50-pound stone object, though. You keep it on the mule. Yeah. Um, they're they're <laughs> yeah. heavy. And so a Roman army can turn 
a field of enemy grain into bread on its own, mm. um, wow. which is a remarkable logistics advantage. And that capability is clearly central to the Roman army, and it had to have emerged at some point. Would you have needed it to fight Vei in 406? No, because you can just bring a lunch. I was um, going like to say, it's right less than there. a day's walk away. They'll be fine. Have your crunch and sip as you go. Yeah. <laughs> but clearly, as Roman warfare spreads out, the logistical sophistication builds. On the flip side, especially if you're trading raiders back and forth with Vei over and over again, you raid their fields, they raid your fields, you're both pulling people out of the fields, and at the same time, you're both wrecking each other's farming, you can see how this would produce food shortages, and mm. I can believe that it did. It, it is it is worth noting, this is a really long-standing argument, mostly in Greek historiography, that is the historiography of ancient Greece, not the historiography written in modern Greek. Um, <laughs> it is really hard to permanently damage ancient farms, but it is really easy to disrupt them for a year. And so you can absolutely see how this kind of warfare, when it's high intensity, would become disruptive enough to become inconvenient. Though, again, mm -hmm. caveats about Livy reading manpower shortages when these armies may not be large enough to pull that many men. Yeah, Sorry, Most societies <laughs> can't get enough people into an army to cause later labor shortages. Mm -mm. The Romans certainly can by the Second Punic War, and that's shocking, but most societies can't. Um, they're simply, they're, they, they're not well organized enough to recruit that hard. Well, and as you highlighted, again, as far as we can tell from the references we get in our source material, <laughs> slavery was a thing, you know, from very early on. And so the slaves wouldn't necessarily obviously been going off to fight, rather not. And so if you're leaving them behind, presumably they can tend your fields. <laughs> yeah, though, of course, awkward questions about how many are they. Exactly, yes. Um, generally speaking so one um straight up before like 225 we don't know but but generally speaking and here there's a lot of 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 skepticism but uh, walter scheidel and a few arguments kind of laid out like here's got to be what the range is italy is weirdly enough it seems in in the middle republic it is definitely a slave society but it is perhaps less so than greece um, we might assume maybe about a third of people in Greece are enslaved versus maybe 10, 15 percent in Roman Italy. So you, you can imagine that not being enough to keep the economy running. That figure will rise dramatically as a result of Roman conquests to something like maybe even 20 percent, 25 percent by mm -hmm. the early empire, which is probably the peak. And then the figure then would begin to fall again, uh, we think. But yes, this is definitely a slave society. And so you do have... You do have laborers who are viewed as unfit for military service. And this is mm -hmm. a clear theme for the Romans. If in a crisis you want to put slaves in the army, you must free them first. Which is really interesting because you have a lot of other societies that will enroll slaves in the army with the promise of freedom at the end of the campaign. And the Romans <laughs> are like, no, 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 no. Before you hand anybody a weapon, they have to be a freed person. You know, you cannot have enslaved people in the army or the navy. You have to free them first. And, you know, that's a, a sort of striking Roman cultural quirk that probably fits with, I mean, the Romans are also a more manumission-y slave society than most. They free yeah. more slaves than most. Though, again, so that people don't get the wrong idea, ancient slavery sucked. And there was a lot of it. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't want people to walk away with too rosy a picture of what was a very ugly institution. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I have learned so much and I do believe you. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> just thought I'd say that. Um, to wrap up, we thought it might be a good idea for you to tell us maybe like your top three misconceptions about the early Roman military that you'd love for people to have a more accurate view of. I'm actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two. Okay. I have consoles rather than military champions with consular powers um <laughs> because i think there's sort of twin pitfalls for the roman army in almost every period and it's even more true when your evidence is weak and to the right the pitfall is excessive modernism it is the assumption that the roman army looks like modern armies and has the values of modern armies and you get a lot of popular facing stuff both supposedly nonfiction, but also a lot of historical fiction 
that reads into like, well, the Romans were basically like Marines, right? Like they had the values of like the U.S. military. <laughs> um, I'm going to call in an offer. Stephen Pressfield's books are awful for this. Um, he does it to the Greeks too. And it's nonsense. The man has very little grasp on ancient value systems, I'm afraid. I'm sorry if you enjoy his books. So that's sort of one pitfall is assuming excessive modernity, uniform equipment, that they have values like modern soldiers, as I have been arguing about lately, that they view gender issues the way moderns do. And then, of course, the other danger is excessive primitivism. That is that that falls off on the other side and is like, well, these are just kind of like disorganized warrior bands. And like, no, I mean, these are intelligent thinking human beings who are trying to organize armies and win battles and not die. And they are doing their best to organize that. And, you know, at least by the time we get to the Middle Republic, the level of sophistication here is significant and it has been mm -hmm. developing for some time. And so you kind of want to resist the idea that these guys are just banging rocks together. Um, and so, I mean, I sort of see those as like the twin pitfalls. And then the question is, how do you navigate the difficult space in the middle? And and the answer is, I think, to let the sources guide you as, as much as they can, albeit with your healthy dose of skepticism. <laughs> always. Always. That's our always. Weapon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. This was great. This was a real pleasure. And yeah, it's one of these areas which... It is so uh, full of information on the one hand and so full of questions on the other that it, it obviously has this, uh, propels a sense of curiosity about like, how do these people live their lives? How is the Roman world really working? And it becomes such an increasing part of what they do and what they end up having leaving as a legacy. So to be able to understand it better, to see where these gaps are emerging, to know what we don't know, <laughs> I think it's really, really, really <laughs> useful. So thank you so much again for coming on the show. Well, and in, and in I don't know, 10 or 15 years, when you guys get to the Middle Republic, I can come back and talk about that <laughs> army. Please oh, we'll do. Definitely need you. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll be so confused by them. We'll be like, oh, man, yeah. another battle. Oh, here yeah. we go. There's so Soon many battles. As soon as they start talking about, like, troop movements, my eyes just, like, glaze over. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that uh, from where we're coming from, um, like our background is more like social history and and Fiona's uh, is reception. And so thinking about how this really intricate and really sophisticated and important element of the Roman world operates is really useful. Um, so, yeah, it's been great. And and as I as I repeat over and over again, when I talk about military history, when I teach military history, social history and military history are not separate. Because no army can help but recreate the structures of its societies on, on the battlefield. Every army does it. Ours, theirs, all of them. So you have to understand both. Mm -mm, uh, that's a very good point. You made me made me more inspired to learn about military history. I am going to pre-order your book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oxford University Press, please. Yeah. Put yeah. me on your waiting list. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to get them a manuscript first. Um, Easy peasy. Uh, right, I know, yeah. just a simple thing, you know. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of The Partial Historians. You can find our sources, sound credits, and an automated transcript in our show notes. Our music is by Bettina Joy de Guzman. You too can support our show and help us to produce more engaging content about the ancient world by becoming a Patreon. In return, you receive exclusive early access to our special episodes. If monthly patronage is just not your style, we also have merch, a book, or you can buy us a coffee on Ko-fi. However, if your imperial coffers do not overflow with, one of the easiest and most important ways to help us is to tell someone about the show or give us a five-star review. Why not both? Until next time, we are yours in ancient Rome. <laughs>